Now may I introduce the moderator, ASCE Texas Section Transportation and Development Institute Chapter Representative, Craig Vickery. Thank you, Anne Marie, and thank you all for joining us today for the Texas Section ASCE's Transportation and Development Institute webinar on mitigating risk of playing hurricane Russian roulette with the Houston Galveston area. I'd like to thank the branches for hosting viewing sites all across Texas. As the State Association for Civil Engineers, we are happy to provide this service to the engineering community. If you are not a member of ASCE or the Texas section, I invite you to become a member so that you can benefit from being a part of this professional association. Now I am pleased to introduce our presenter for today's training, Colonel Lynn Waterworth. Colonel Lynn Waterworth joined Texas A&M University at Galveston as an executive professor in the Department of Maritime Administration in 2014. Colonel Waterworth is also the special assistant to the CEO for leadership development and the associate director for outreach in the Center for the Texas Beaches and Shores. He holds a master's in strategic, of strategic studies from the U.S. Army War College and a master of engineering administration from George Washington University. His duties include working to coordinate Ike Dyke hurricane surge protection research activities with Texas A&M and Galveston faculty and other research partners, including Delft University of Technology located in the Netherlands, the largest and oldest Dutch public technical university. The Institute for Regional Forecasting at my alma mater, the University of Houston, Homeland Center of Excellence at Jackson State University in Mississippi, the S-Speed Center at Rice University, as well as public outreach efforts with businesses, municipalities, and non-governmental organizations in the Houston Galveston region. After a long and successful career in the U.S. Army, Colonel Waterworth has had similarly successful career in top admin administration in both governmental and private sectors, Army Corps of Engineers, Bannenbaum Engineering Corporation, and most recently as Executive Director at the Port of Houston Authority. And with that, I'll hand it over to uh, Colonel Waterworth. Thank you. Oh, thank, yeah, thank you very much. Uh, just a quick question. Do you see this little control panel on, on my screen? Yes. Okay, let me see if I can get rid of this right quick. See if I'm still here. No, I don't want to do that. Anna Marie, how do I get rid of this? Um, I only see... Uh... Probably, it's probably in view at the top menu. Uh, huh. We only see um, down in the bottom left, is that the, the menu you're talking about with the pen and yeah. the... No, do you see the uh, the chat with the, oh, no, uh, no. the microphone? No, oh, no. Oh, okay, good. No, You're good. Yeah. Fantastic. Okay, because I was concerned that you see that. Okay, well, apologize for the delay, but thank you very much for this opportunity. But uh, what you should be looking at right now is a picture of uh, a trip that I was going back to my house on Galveston after spending a week down in New Orleans chasing work as the president and CEO of Dannenbaum Engineering Corporation. And this is about three weeks after uh, Hurricane Ike hit in September of 2008. And there had been extensive cleanup. But uh, right about this time, I was wondering what my house would look like because I just finished uh, remodeling the house after about two years. And the last coat of paint went on the outside of it the weekend before the storm. Uh, and I was wondering if, uh, if there would be anything left. Very devastating at the driving up the island at that point. Well, one of the things uh, that uh, I want to talk about is that Hurricane Ike had a tremendous impact. But to understand the impact that it had, you have to understand the region, the region itself. 
And the region, essentially we're talking about the 10 county area in and around Galveston Bay has now grown to about 6 million people. And it continues to grow. Since 2008, it's added about another million people uh, and created jobs. It's the fourth largest city and lots of folks are talking about taking, uh, surpassing Chicago sometime in the next decade. And a lot of that was driven by job creation. And that job creation came from uh, the second largest petrochemical complex in the world. Uh, if you look at the 52 miles of ship channel and 150 businesses, you're talking about uh, one of the busiest waterways in the Western Hemisphere. Over 8,300, 8,400 deep water ships travel from all over the world coming up through the ship channel. And that doesn't count for the moves between refineries to refineries. There's another 20,000 moves of ships that, once they enter into the Port of Houston Authority, uh, move around. So now you have 8,400 ships. You now also have to consider the, the uh, traffic in the Gulf Intercoastal Waterway, another 250,000 barges. So if you take a Bolivar Road, the entrance to the port to the Galveston Bay complex, that is the busiest waterway uh, in the Western Hemisphere. Also, think about what the economy looks like. Texas has been the leading exporter in the United States for the last 15 years, and what you have in this region alone is the number one exporting region. We're talking about uh, over 110 billion dollars. And we're talking about uh, the investment that the private uh, industry has made. Uh, over the last, uh, since 2014, we're aware of uh, $50 billion. And when I look at permits, it looks like uh, $100 billion of private investment have gone into, uh, uh, gone into the region. In fact, just recently, Exxon talked about another $24 billion going into the region. So, we have people, we have the economy, but uh, what surprises lots of folks is that uh, Galveston Bay is the seventh largest estuary uh, in the United States and the second most productive right behind Chesapeake Bay. If you look at long-term trends uh, and you think about 1980, if you'd walk the beach of Galveston, you'd have to have some kerosene and a rag to wipe the, uh, the tar off your feet. Uh, but now we've got uh, increased uh, improving air quality, improving water quality, and we have an estuary that uh, is one of the most productive in the United States. So these are the investments. These are people, the economy, and the environment that, uh, that in and around the, uh, the Houston-Galveston area. Many people don't realize that 25 to 35 percent of most petrochemical products distributed throughout the United States comes from this 52 miles of ship channel. It's quite the investment that we've made. But here's the risk. The risk is that uh, if you look back from uh, through recorded time here, you have 12 major hurricanes that hit, have hit the northern six counties of Texas. And when I talk about the northern six counties, I'm talking about the petrochemical manufacturing complex on the Sabine Natchez, the 52 miles of ship channel with 150 businesses on the Houston Galveston ship channel, and you talk about Freeport, 12 of them. On a very simple average, we're talking about a hurricane that crosses the six county area about once every 14 to 15 years. Now, why do I stop at 2005? 2005 was the last Category 3 that came in into the Gulf and hit this particular region. We're right now well over 4,000 days in sort of a hurricane drought, some are describing it. But the risk is still there. And the risk of uh, damage and catastrophic damage to our communities is huge and catastrophic damage to the national economy. So you had Ike. I hit in 2008. It was only a Category 2 storm, and it, but it was still the third most costliest hurricane in U.S. history, right behind uh, Katrina, uh, Hurricane uh, Excuse me. Uh, Thirty billion dollars. It, uh, in Texas, 34 Texas counties declared federal disasters just because of the storm. 
What's really interesting is that everybody thinks of a hurricane as a coastal event, but if you think about uh, 50 miles inland up uh, the Houston-Galveston Ship Channel uh, into Harris County, there were 92,000 homes damaged. Uh, just going down through these things, you start to look at uh, the damage that was caused on Bolivar. 3,418 homes uh, were destroyed in the, on the Bolivar Peninsula, or excuse me, 3,266 homes destroyed in the Bolivar Peninsula. And if you can imagine, you've seen that uh, one yellow house at Rollover Pass, the last house standing. But we were very fortunate. This is the damage, about $30 billion worth of damage. But what, ha what transpired is that uh, at the evening, four hours before the storm hit, reports were given to Governor Perry that they thought the storm would be a Category 5 right up the ship channel. He was given estimates of a million casualties. Uh, but what actually happened was that uh, it veered a little bit off, off the path, the projected path, and it took out Bolivar. So it was a very dangerous storm, but it's still not a Category 3, 4, or 5, which we are accustomed to seeing once every 15 years or so. Now what happened is that uh, right in November of 2008, a uh, couple things had happened already since the storm. The storm hit September 13th. The following week we had the Great Recession start with the economic collapse. And when you had storms on the East Coast or West Coast or New Orleans in 2005, you had national attention to it. Ike only received about a weekend's worth of attention before the economic crisis hit. And at that point, you have uh, Dr. Bill Merrill starting talk, talking to Gidry News. Gidry News is a local internet uh, news service, and he started talking about the concept of the Ike Dyke a catchy little name that tried to visualize, give people visualization of what we were talking about. But it was clear that we we're not getting the federal response to protect people, the environment, or, or, or businesses. So under uh, the guidance of Dr. Merrill, he started talking to uh, Gidry News, the Galveston Bay Foundation, and he came up with a concept called the Ike Deck. It protected those things that we find valuable and what has transport, what, how the Ike Dyke developed was Dr. Merrill with over 40 years of experience looking at all the surge reduction uh, systems in the world and focusing in on the Netherlands who has a, a, a coastal spine in place uh, and the efficiencies and the effectiveness of that coastal spine. In the Netherlands in 1958, uh, northern storm surged in through the Netherlands killing about 1,800 people. Up to that time, they had levee systems around key infrastructure. Uh, but that, led, that storm led to a coastal spine with large gates. And uh, so Dr. Merrill started talking about it. He started raising money uh, throughout the communities and started to do re research in reference to a coastal spine. Now, many of you get involved with the Corps of Engineers process. I was the district commander with the Galveston Engineer uh, District. And you get involved with the core process, you know that uh, one of the first steps in determining if uh, is a possible project is that is there a federal interest? And after you do a federal, federal interest, you have to figure out if there's a feasible project. Well, nobody was moving on protecting the region from another Ike type event. So Dr. Merrill started to research through his uh, uh, analysis. He started focusing in on uh, the coastal spine. And we started research at Texas A&M Galveston to determine if this project was feasible. What's interesting is that uh, we've been at it since uh, about 2009. And what we have found and what we've modeled is that if the Ike Dyke was in place, uh, there would have been a 95% reduction in damage from the hurricane. And what's, for those that uh, understand the Galveston Bay and the sensitivity to the environment, this, is one of the, this project doesn't build anything on precious bay bottom and fish habitat. So if you want a bottom line, this is the bottom line of this, is that we believe that the coastal spine 
uh, is a feasible project. But the problem is, since 2008, there has not been a solution. There has been very little movement on trying to protect the region from a hurricane. Now, some of you may say that uh, what is the coastal spine? Well, if you've been down to Galveston, you would see that uh, we already have part of that coastal spine in. It's called the seawall. And if you can see uh, the graphic in front of you, you have a solid yellow bar, which is the depiction of where the current seawall lies. The seawall was a response to the storm in uh, September 8, 1900. And uh, that storm killed estimated six to 8,000 people. And the response essentially was to build a, uh, a seawall, 17 feet high. It's uh, recognized by ASCE as a historically significant infrastructure project. But I want you to think about what they did in uh, the 1900s. Almost immediately, they raised money, sought for federal funds, and they started building a, uh, a seawall, 17 feet high. But what What's also interesting is that uh, if you've ever been on the island and you've turned up uh, 61st Street going towards the Gulf, you see a large bay complex off at Bay. They dredged for over 10 years material out of that off its bay, and essentially they backfilled the seawall. All the homes and churches that were there were raised up into the air to, to meet grade as the seawall goes from 17 feet high to the bay side. Uh, at the water level. Uh, churches, full Gothic churches, 740, uh, 740 uh, cranks put underneath it, uh, jacks put underneath it, turned a quarter of a turn at a time and they were raised to, to, to meet the grade. So it's a phenomenal piece of infrastructure that has paid extreme dividends for the island and everything up behind the island for the longest period of time. The coastal spine is essentially an extension of that. We're talking about going down to San Luis Pass, which is a natural opening uh, to the southwest, up to rollover, up to the north northeast. And what we're talking about is also having a gate at Bolivar Roads, a navigation and an environmental gate. The engineering of this is relatively simple is that when you have a hurricane in the Gulf of Mexico, it sort of it has this large spinning rotation to it, and it forces water up into the coastline. When you have something as large as Ike, uh, it pushes a significant amount of water up through Bolivar Roads, the natural opening, and St. Louis Pass. Galveston Bay is naturally about 10 to 12 feet deep. It does have a ship channel carved into it, that uh, 45 feet deep and 530 foot wide. But what kills people is surge. You have to run from surging water. You can't hunker down. And when you have a natural uh, bay that's about 10 to 12 feet uh, deep and you start to have a hurricane in the Gulf, it pushes water and that water could estimate be up to 20 or 20 plus feet high. So one of the ideas, what the idea that the theory behind this is first you knock down the, uh, the storm coming in and then you don't let water build up into, into the Galveston Bay complex itself. So the idea is a coastal spine. If you could see this, it gives you a little bit of an idea. Uh, there's several different ideas. I'll talk about the coastal spine first. Uh, there's a couple different ideas. We at Texas A&M Galvin, Galveston believe it is the last dune on the beach. A T-wall type structure that runs the length other than uh, the seawall itself, but runs approximately 60 miles in total length and that, that structure is covered with sand and sea grasses. This is not our idea, this is an idea done in the Netherlands and it's proven to be very effective. But that would provide the coastal spine, the structure of the coastal spine, and it also gives the opportunity uh, for uh, recreation. It gives opportunity for uh, the, the uh, turtles. It looks look very, very natural. But there's a price with that. That would require sand replenishment, lots of O&M, uh, but this is going to be a project that we, 
live on, and we have a preference for that particular option. Other options include raising the roads. Uh, if you raise the roads up to approximately 17 feet, uh, you already have right-of-way. A lot of these roads already belong to, uh, to TxDOT. Uh, the problem with that is you're going to have people that are on the wrong size, sides of the surge barrier. Uh, another option is come behind the road and put up essentially a, uh, a wall. Uh, so we're going through, there's feasibility studies currently being done, and they're looking at those options. The other major feature, which is uh, probably the, the biggest cost factor, close to 3.6 uh, to uh, $4 billion, is the gate structure at Bolivar Roads and maybe at St. Louis Pass. Uh, when, we, when you look at this, uh, the reach, we now currently have uh, ferries uh, working that area to take traffic back and forth, but we're talking about a two-mile stretch of water. And as I said before, it's one of the busiest waterways. The Bolivar Road is one of the busiest waterways. It would ha naturally have two components. It would have an environmental barrier. These are, could be something like guillotine gates that are up virtually uh, all the time, allowing ba uh, uh, biomass to go back and forth uh, through there. So we're trying to make sure that uh, any design takes into account first as a primary design criteria uh, environment. We don't want, to, we have a long, we have a uh, trend of improving the water quality, air quality, uh, fishing capabilities here in the bay. We don't want to disturb that. So we're thinking an environmental gate, and right now we're pushing that research forward to have the environment uh, and the impacts, the minimize the impacts of the environment in the design in the environmental gate. The other part of the gate would be a what we think is going to be a barge gate, a big swinging gate that would stay open virtually 95% of the time, so that it doesn't hinder traffic, ship traffic. So what you end up having is that uh, you can have a system of a coastal spine and gates at uh, Bolivar Roads that would essentially protect the region. Our modeling, we've run several different storms against it. We've run Ike against it. And when we're talking about about 60 miles long, 17 foot high, we would have reduced the damage of Ike, the third costliest storm in uh, history, hurricane uh, in history, uh, we would have reduced damage by 95%. Now, that's the concept. Keep the water out of the bay. Now, we've been at it since 2008, or Texas A&M's been at it since 2008, and with any large project, uh, there are several things that happen. First of all, you have to get grassroots support. We have well over 50 organizations uh, 21 organizations supporting and 29 cities supporting the concept of building building the uh, coastal spine. But we've not gotten a lot of traction till, until about uh, 2016. Uh, hurricanes have a tendency to have damage. We recover. We forget about them until the next storm. In fact, one of the biggest issues in project formulation is trying to, to make this a... Uh, a priority where you put national resources against protecting uh, an economic center of gravity, which is the Houston Galveston Ship Channel and the, the 150 industries along, along that. Uh, hurricanes have a tendency to be forgotten, especially when you're in a long hurricane drought. But we're now starting to see that uh, we know and we understand that hurricanes come every about every 14 years. And it's been since 2008 that we've had a hurricane at all, and 2005 since we've had a Category 3, 4, or 5 uh, hit the coastline. So people are starting to understand or starting to have a, a feeling for that the risk is increasing. It's starting to, that something needs to be done. But here's the problem that I've faced since I've been here, is that we as Americans have a tendency to be reactive in nature. We're not very proactive at trying to protect those things that uh, create jobs or our environment, but uh, Americans are very quick to mobilize uh, when after a disaster. The question is, can we afford that? Uh, 
and uh, we've been trying to find a proactive solution. But here's the rub. There's lots of requirements out there by the government. There's lots of things to do. Uh, in the time of uh, 2005 when New Orleans was hit, uh, it received lots of media attention uh, and the national will was there to uh, help protect New Orleans, Louisiana from future hurricanes. Uh, the U.S. government came in, essentially told, uh, essentially said, here is $14 billion in the Corps of Engineers. You can change your processes to have the project delivered in six years. Uh, we had the national will to protect New Orleans, a town of about 380,000 and a state of about uh, 4 million people. Uh, but nothing has been done for this area, even though the size of the economy of scale, economy of industry is so much larger. Well, because we had the Great Recession right afterwards. So we're trying to build the will, get political input. We've had uh, Senator Corn come in and, and write legislation telling the Corps to use existing studies. Uh, we've had, uh, which is good, we have uh, people like Senator Larry Taylor from uh, from the state Texas Senate, uh, Wayne Faircloth, Representative Faircloth, they all are now starting to support the idea and, and talk about what, the, what we can do proactively. And a lot of them are talking about the normal core process. Uh, if you've seen my bio or looked it up on uh, my Facebook or LinkedIn page, is that uh, 25 years in the Army, 20 years blowing things up, five years building uh, projects following the core project process. The core process has never built a project of this size using the normal core process. Uh, in fact, uh, appropriations come from Congress on an annual basis, so it's very, very difficult to build a project of this size and magnitude. And one thing that I've just realized I may have failed is that uh, there are several different estimates out there uh, for the coastal spine. Uh, the, uh, there is an organization called uh, uh, the Gulf Coast Community Protection and Recovery District was organized by the state that has been doing studies. They've estimated that this particular project's in the realm of about $6 billion. Uh, our estimates at Texas A&M are in the realm of about $8 billion. Uh, and uh, there are uh, uh, people at the GLO that are looking for uh, over $10 billion to not only work on this project, but uh, projects in Freeport and Sabine because they understand the economic impact of the six county area. But the time is click ticking. We know that statistically we should, we are very vulnerable for a hurricane. Will it happen tomorrow? Who knows? Will it happen 10 years from now? Who knows, but on a simple average, we should expect something in, the, in uh, every 14 years, and our investments continue to increase. The risk of the area continues to increase as more and more people move in, more and more investments are made uh, in this particular area. So the, the bottom line is the coastal spine is feasible. It uh, didn't follow the core process. Essentially, uh, we looked at it. We, decided that the coastal spine uh, was the cheapest way to protect the greatest number of people, protect the, all the environment, and protect the businesses. It left nobody on the wrong side of the surge, uh, of the surge barrier. It didn't build anything on uh, critical bay bottom and fish habitat. And when we started running models again, it against it was feasible. Protecting over 95% of the damage uh, would have been prevented if we had gone, uh, if I could hit it or been in, if the coastal spine was in place and at the time of Ike. So what's happened at, at Texas A&M? Well, we have a Center for Texas Beaches and Shores established in the early 90s by the State uh, House of Representatives, but they've not, uh, they have not funded this particular project or this particular center. So we've done everything uh, on overhead or by donations from our communities and we've had significant amount of support from our communities. But this operation is run by uh, Dr. Sam Brody and he has been doing research on coastal resiliency and working with Delft University and Bill Merrill 
to find solutions for our Texas coastlines. Here's the here is the uh, here's the mission statement in re reference what they do, and we're currently trying to find funding to continue to push forward. This is the center under Dr. Merrill's leadership using this center and uh, assets from Jackson State. Uh, which has a significant amount of uh, retired core folks that worked on uh, the New Orleans project and Delta University all pulled together to work on the uh, coastal spine to determine that it was feasible. But there's been some other products that uh, are uh, that uh, that you should be aware of. First of all, uh, the center, even though it's not been funded by Texas, it's now getting uh, funding from the National Science Foundation partnerships. Uh, they've, uh, the National Science Foundation has looked down and started to realize the impact that Texas has on trade, the leading uh, the nation for 15 years in foreign trade, the petrochemical manufacturing complex. Uh, the center has been awarded a uh, money close to uh, three and a half million dollars to essentially ask a very simple question. What do we have to do to change uh, national policy? And that national policy is that we don't have one in reference to being proactively protecting vital national vital interests. Uh, it's very reactionary. Can we afford to be hit by another hurricane for the impacts that we have in the United States? But I think the other product that I really want you to take a look at being American Society of Civil Engineers is that the research that's been done by the Center for Texas Beaches and Shores uh, is peer-reviewed and it is put into a into a database, a GIS database, which is available on the Center for Texas Beaches and Shores website. The Coastal Atlas takes uh, information and data collected or developed and peer-reviewed and puts it into a format that is available to everyone uh, that goes to the particular website. Now, since we're on the internet and I'm not quite sure what everybody's internet capabilities, I just, uh, before you start going to the Center for Texas Beaches and Shores to see the Coastal Atlas, let me just give you a little hint of what, it's, what it would look like. This is a Clear Lake area of uh, Galveston Bay, and if you're familiar with Galveston Bay, this is about at the nine, nine o'clock position in the bay. Uh, it is home to things like uh, Kima. It is home to one of the largest sailboat populations. We're talking about very expensive homes. We're talking NASA, just to the northern boundary of this. So we have significant amount of, of uh, resources and investment made in this particular area. What the Coastal Atlas can do is you can come in and pick several layers, just like any GIS database, select several layers of what you want to take a look at. You can take a look at inundation. You can look at damage. Uh, you can take a look at uh, house, the prices of house. You, we're now doing uh, FEMA damage and FEMA insurance uh, for the area, taking a look at that. And you can overlay as many of these layers upon it, and then what you can do is run it with and without the coastal spine. And what you see is this bar in the middle of the screen that goes up and down. Essentially, you can grab your pointer and slide it back and forth to see what the damage is. Now, from an individual, if you go to the Center for Texas, Texas Beaches and Shores, right in the middle of the page, uh, halfway down, you'll find our movie. It's about a nine-minute movie. I was going to attempt to show you that movie here, but uh, I don't think the Internet access would uh, allow everybody to see it at the right speed. So I encourage you to go f to uh, the Center for Texas Beaches and Shore website and watch the movie. It does a better job of introducing you to the Coastal Atlas uh, right here. Uh, but what you can do is, with the coastal spine in place or with or without project conditions, you can go back and forth. Now, what does this mean to the individual? Individuals can go down and say, okay, uh, we have this kind of storm. What could be the impacts to my home? And you can look at inundation or damage. Uh, you can take a look and say, do I want to evacuate or not evacuate? And it's a personal choice, but the data is there for you to take a look at. Or if, 
at, from a business, do I want to build in the area? Or from a county or state level, what's the impact to my hospitals? What's the impact of wastewater treatment? What's the impact uh, to sewage plants and uh, water plants? Uh, now you can start to do some strategic planning on what the impacts are with and without condition. And this is all available. All the research we have is public domain research, and we make it available on the Coastal Atlas. I encourage you to go take a look at that. Now here's the website uh, for Texas A&M University Galveston EDU at CTBS. I'd encourage you to all go take a look at that. And let me just round back around, let me come back around to that first slide. That first slide, as you remember, is we started across the past Tiki Island, start to come across the causeway, and I was going back to my house uh, on Avenue Q. And it had just been uh, remodeled and uh, just finished a total rebuild, bought the most uh, expensive house in the neighborhood, uh, which wasn't very much. Ended up putting three times as much money as I bought the house for, and the weekend before the storm, it would just finish painting. I thought for sure the house was going to be lost. But as I crossed the causeway and went back up to my house, uh, I looked, and the sh shingles were there, the palm trees were up, all 13 palm trees were up, uh, the sh shutters were on, there was some debris in the yard, I walked into the house, the lights went on, my 50-inch television went on, the air conditioning went on, and other than the gas being turned off by the city, there was absolutely no damage to my house. Whereas if I walked two blocks to the gulf and walked up on the seawall, there was a debris wall 15 foot high that had been stacked uh, by the winds that essentially went for about two miles. What saved me was being first very, very lucky, but also being very thankful for those folks uh, like the Kempners and the, that came in, put their own money up, and started getting the government, the county and the federal government involved on building the seawall. My house is essentially two blocks off the seawall, the military crest. Not, so when the storm came in, hit the seawall, went over my house, but when all that water from Ike got pushed up, it got pushed up into the bay, because we didn't have gates at Bolivar Roads, we didn't have a 60-mile seawall to, to knock it down. The water got pushed up into the northern part of the bay, and they were anticipating surges up near Houston, up near Chambers County at 27 feet. They only got somewhere close to 17, 18 feet up there, but when that water, the wind duration stopped, the water came pushing back, came back through the same communities that's destroyed Shore Acres uh, and uh, Galveston, and that water came up through the bayside, up through the island, and came up to about two feet underneath my house, which sits up at about 42 inches above the grade. I was at the sweet spot, but 80% of the homes in, in Galveston were damaged. So I was very, very thankful for those folks that built the, the seawall. The question is, what do we do now? Should we wait for the next disaster? Should we wait to try to evacuate a million people? Uh, or should we try to do something proactively? We at Center for Texas Beaches and Shores, Texas and m Galveston, look to uh, try to build a coastal spine to protect the investments we've made in people, the environment, and the businesses. So that concludes my presentation. I encourage you to go to our website, watch the movie. It does a lot better job explaining this than I do. And please, as uh, civil engineers, take a look at the, uh, uh, the coastal atlas. I think there will be many uh, things, uh, research out of there that uh, I think you'll find useful in uh, running a civil engineering business. Thank you. Thank you very much. Colonel Warlock, I don't see any questions from the uh, attendees, but I, I guess I have just a, a general question. Um, in your in your research and, and, and the work you guys have done, is there a scaled down version of the the spine that could be you know fifty percent effective, sixty percent effective? 
big on the reserve. Instead of doing the entire run with the land barriers and, and all the gates and so on and so forth, that the one portion would be most beneficial to focus on with limited funding? Well, when you talk about the limited funds, we've, we're taking a look at that and keeping the water out of the bay is one of the key points to uh, the project. So the gate uh, appears that might have the greatest impact uh, and may want to be built first, but now you're talking about the most expensive component of the entire system, uh, $3.4 billion. Uh, and uh, we want to make sure it's environment and stuff. But if you take a look at the entire project, uh, the, the coastal spine itself has, comes in at about a $5.6 billion estimate from the Gulf Coast Community Protection and Recovery District study. I think it's going to be a little bit more, uh, but the question becomes, do you want to build uh, something less effective when you start talking about six million people? Or we're talking about the Houston-Galveston uh, ship channel and the 150 businesses providing close to 20% of the state's GDP. Uh, do you want to build something less? Now, there's some other options that have been considered uh, there was a uh, option of uh, building something in the one or two billion dollar category up uh, near the Fred Hartman Bridge. That's right at the beginning of near the beginning of uh, Buffalo Bayou, and a preponderance of businesses are up in that location. The problem with that is that you're protecting industry. Uh, industry came online going like uh, it doesn't do us you know we take do a lot to protect our industry from these kind of events. Uh, there would be an impact, but We've done a lot, but we really need our people protected. We can't run an operation without uh, people. We can't. People can't live here if their wastewater treatment, and water treatment, uh, their roads are destroyed. And by the time you recover all that, marketplace would change, and we may end up moving our operations to places all over the world where we already have factories. So they didn't like that option of being. Uh, further north. There's also options inside the bay, uh, options, but the question becomes who do you leave on the wrong side of the surge suppression barrier? And uh, we, our particular case is that we think you need the barrier, the entire barrier, at six billion dollars. Ike was a thirty billion dollar uh, write-off and we believe it's not only economically wise to protect the, the resources uh, invested, but it's also socially just. Uh, it's very hard to move people out of old folks' homes. Uh, the poor that uh, aren't uh, linked in with uh, the news sources get damaged, ruins their homes. So is there ways to do it? Well, I think that's a question that needs to be resolved, but uh, before we do that, we got to the point that uh, we're at is something like the coastal spine is feasible and we think it's the best solution. And a lot of the community members around here. Uh, support that too. Understood. Understood. I do see one question on there. Uh, I don't remember the reference, but it says, uh, "What was the document that you mentioned about running the two on your own?" Uh, can the document that say again? You're coming in a little bit. Uh... Yeah. The, uh, the question is, what was the document? that you mentioned about running your civil engineering business? The document? Yeah. Well, I was, I, I'm not sure exactly what the question, I, when I left uh, the Corps of Engineers in my 25 year Army career in 2005, I went to work for Jim Dannenbaum of Dannenbaum Engineering Corporation. And a couple years there, I was end up becoming the President and CEO of uh, of the corporation and uh, was there until 2012. Uh, so I'm not sure what document. I was uh, right at the time of uh, that picture was taken, I was just flying in from uh, New Orleans where we were chasing projects on those big pumps that were put in. And uh, it was just the time they opened up the, uh, up the island for residents to get back on. So I'm not quite sure which document they're talking about, but that gives you a little history of uh, of my uh, seven years in the private sector. Well, very good. I think that was all the questions. So thank you for the, uh, the work you're doing and taking time to do the presentation today. You bet. Uh, you're welcome.
for everybody that joined us. Also, thank you for uh, participating in uh, today's Texas section, uh, Transportation Development Institute webinar. Uh, as was mentioned before, uh, individual registrants should receive an attendance acknowledgement uh, without having to do anything else. For those of you attending in a group, the uh, site coordinator will receive a PDH certificate. I invite all of you to uh, visit the Texas section website, uh, www.texas.org, to register for uh, future webinars and learn more about the association, ways to take advantage of the benefits you receive from membership with us. Also on our website, please keep in mind you can watch uh, recorded webinars on demand and earn PDHs. Uh, so be sure to take advantage of all those as well. I'm always available for questions, so feel free to uh, reach out to me, Paul. And uh, thank you for your attendance and make it a great day. This concludes today's webinar. Thank you for joining us. The session will now close.